Amanda Gress, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending this evening's program. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the bipartisan mission of the Dole Institute. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests and preference when applying for our internship assistance program or for paid student positions at the Institute. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoyed this evening's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. Before we, be we begin tonight, I'd like you to, to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. Hearing assistance is available and we have a loop seating section at each program designated by a sign. If you have any questions about the loop or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers here in the hall and they can assist. And now, please welcome our Associate Director, Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you very much, Amanda. Good evening and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and welcome to our second series of what we're doing with our programs this evening. I think you all know it's the Presidential Lecture Series. 2006 was our first program. This is First Woman President 2.0. Before I introduce our special guest speaker this evening, I would just like to mention that we have a full schedule of our Dole Institute programs, and I would invite you to go to doleinstitute.org. We also have a video gallery, so in case you miss some of our programs, they're all recorded, you can go and catch up on what you did not have an opportunity. Um, we also have a special Dole Archives program, and we'll be in Topeka on Thursday, February 26th at Washburn University. So please check our website for details, and um, we'll really ask if you're interested to RSVP for this event. We would also like to thank each of you that are friends of the Dole Institute who are here tonight for all of your support. You are valuable to us. If you are not already a member, please think about becoming a member as well. And now I'd like to introduce you tonight to our speaker. I think some people are a little concerned with the bad weather in Boston, whether she'd get here or not. You see her, she's right there. And for those of you who are not familiar with Barbara Lee, and I would have to say Barbara Lee was here for our first series in 2006. Uh, Barbara Lee has worked to elect women in politics since 1998. Through the foundation's nonpartisan governor's research, Barbara Lee gives women candidates at all levels essential tools to meet the challenging of campaigning. And following in Barbara Lee's footsteps, our guest speaker tonight, Ms. Adrian Kimmel, is the executive director of the Barbara Lee Family Foundation. In carrying out Ms. Lee's vision for helping women, Adrian leads all of the foundation's efforts in these areas. In the political arena, these efforts have changed the dialogue about women in the media, showcase powerful examples of leadership. They have mobilized voters across the political parties through grassroots campaigns. We have provided a showcase for women. So I would like you tonight to just relax, have a good time, and please give a very warm welcome to our guest from the cold, cold country, <laughs> Adrian Kimmel. <laughs> and I'd like to say Bill Lacey, director of the Dole Institute, will be conducting the interview this evening. Bill. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks to all of you for coming out on this cold, snowy night. But you really couldn't avoid coming out tonight since Adrian came all the way from Boston. But we're glad that you braved it. You braved it anyway, and we appreciate the support. Uh, Adrian, welcome to the Dole Institute. It's Thank great to have you here. Me. Thank you. I'm sorry for bringing snow here. I apologize for that. <laughs> I think we had that before you got here. Can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background, your education, yes. 
how you got involved with the Barbara Lee Family Foundation and, and what your role is there. Absolutely. Um, so starting from the beginning, I um, went to my uh, college for undergraduate in upstate New York at a small school called St. Lawrence University where I studied psychology actually that turns out to be valuable um, in everyday life certainly. <clears throat> and. Um, did a lot of internships and work with um, young women and girls, particularly pregnant and parenting teens, um, and saw a lot of the barriers that women face, particularly women from low-income communities, like the community where my college was based. And then went on to really think about what was I going to do next academically. I knew I wanted to go to graduate school and did um, for public policy because I wanted to be able to help people from a more macro perspective. And after leaving graduate school, I started working as a grassroots organizer and later a lobbyist um, where I found the real intersection between public policy and politics and learned firsthand how important it was who was sitting in the state legislature, who was sitting on the county commission on the school board, that no matter how important a policy was to me or to other people, the right people had to be in elective office in order to make those policies actually come to fruition, um, which is what led me to eventually moving to Washington, D.C., where I worked um, with state legislatures and modeled policies that uh, helped women across the country and then also worked for political organizations in, Was in Washington, D.C. and helped to elect people in that regard. So I kind of worked in both the political and the policy uh, sphere um, and then um, moved to back to Boston where I was in graduate school to work for the Barbara Lee Family Foundation um, where as the representative mentioned I lead efforts uh, both in traditional grant making but the majority of what we do is research on women candidates um, particularly women who are running for the highest levels of executive office in their state which is governor and we know from almost 20 years of research that running for governor it has even more barriers than running for a more deliberative body. Voters often see women as CEOs of their state and so there are some higher barriers and some different barriers that women face uh, looking at being an executive of their particular state. They're the decision maker as opposed to a decision maker that is part of a deliberative body. And so we have been studying that for, as I mentioned, almost two decades. What's your assessment of the number of women in public office today? Well, it's fairly dire, although as of tomorrow, we will have six women governors in our entire country. Um, so that's a small bit of progress. Uh, we have about 19% of our Congress um, is, is women. And I believe Kansas, you're in the mid-range for state legislatures are in and around 24%, um, which is kind of the average nationally. But as you can see, that's pretty far away from 50%. And certainly governors, um, we have much further to go from nine uh, women governors all the way to you know having 25, which would be which would be parity. Um, so certainly there's a dearth of women in office, certainly in executive office. Um, we know that women tend to gravitate at first more to what we call the lower pipeline, which is running for things like school board, like county commission. Um, but then they need to keep moving up that political pipeline to their legislatures, to Congress, and beyond. Okay. Explain why you feel um, that women's voices strengthen our democracy and culture. Why is it important to have more women involved in public office? Well, women have a different life experience. They have different experiences than men do. Simple as that. Um, and when women's voices are at the table, the dialogue is simply going to look different than if women are not in the room. And there are a couple examples of that. Um, there are many examples of that, but one of the ones I like to talk about um, is a few years back, about a decade or so, um, the National Institute of Health only did their tests on men for anything related to the medical field. Um, and it wasn't until women in Congress started saying, well, wait a minute, shouldn't women be part of these medical trials? Like, they're, we don't know that things work for men the same way they do for women. Well, all the guys, no offense to them in Congress, never thought that, well, maybe women should be looked at and studied. Um, there's kind of a, another famous um, 
interaction, or famous in the world of women in politics, that is, uh, where there was a debate around uh, the Affordable Care Act, which I'm sure you heard a lot about from um, Secretary Sebelius when she was here. Um, and it was in a committee hearing room, and there were all men, senators, and uh, one woman, and a male senator said, well, I don't think we need to include maternity coverage um, in this bill. I don't think it's important. And the one woman senator said, well, I bet your mom thought it was important. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit of levity, but you can see that just a woman's simple life experience, um, it is different. It needs to be um, part of the dialogue when we're thinking about the policies and how they impact people, how they impact women, how they impact families, how they impact kids. Um, all the voices and, frankly, the best talent need to be represented. We don't want to look at 50% of the talent pool and say, well, that's good enough for us in our state legislature or in our Congress. We want to look at all of the talent. Um, and you know, sure, certainly here at the University of Kansas, there are talented women, there are talented men, and we need, we need their voices heard. One of the things you mentioned, Adrian, that I think is, is very important is that you guys do a lot of research. So we're doing four programs as part of this series. And uh, three of the programs will really be based upon experiences that women who've served have had. But this is the one that really deals directly with the research. So uh, I have a number of questions based on your research, but one of them is, what does it mean uh, for a woman candidate to be, quote, qualified in a voter's mind? Yes. Um, well, um, it, it's obviously important, and of course any voter wants the candidate they're voting for to be qualified. It would be silly if you didn't want a qualified candidate, but for women, they have a bit of a double bind that male candidates don't face. Uh, for, for women, they need to be perceived by voters as both qualified and as likable. For women, likability is a critical aspect of electability. For men, as we know, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, so for women, if they have, a, let's say, a mistake in their economic plan or some kind of error that comes out, voters ding them as being less qualified automatically for making that mistake. And that automatically also dings them in the area of likability. So if they're seen as slightly less qualified because of some kind of mistake that they might have made or an error, they're also seen as less likable. And both of those things bring them down in the eyes of voters. For men, those two dimensions are not linked whatsoever. A man, first of all, doesn't need to be likable to be elected, but a man could make a mistake in their economic plan. It doesn't necessarily ding their qualifications, and it certainly has no bearing whatsoever on their likability and vice versa. For women also, um, with relation to likable and qualified, if they're not seen as likable, they're not warm, people don't gravitate towards them personally for whatever reason, they're then automatically not seen as as qualified. Um, so again, it, it, is, it is a difficult thing for women to manage. The positive thing is, if a woman does make a mistake on the campaign trail, again, a, a mistake or an error or a misstep in some way, um, those things are correctable, our research has found. So if a woman makes a mistake that might make voters see her as less qualified, uh, she can automatically come in and say, you know, I made this mistake, here's the correct information, and have a third party validator come in and talk about how the woman is good on X, Y, or Z issue. And that can ameliorate the ding that they receive from voters. So there's, there's a path to correct that for women. Um, what's interesting, I think, is men actually don't get help from these third party validators. There's less of a path for men if they make a mistake to correct it um, than women. So that's a, it's a benefit and a, a positive thing for women candidates. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other unique challenges that women candidates face? Um, of course, um, one of the things that it can be difficult for women candidates is what's a positive and negative, again, is that they do have an advantage on things like honesty and ethics, but they can really fall down fast if they're kind of pushed off that pedestal. Um, so women are perceived automatically as more ethical and more honest, and that may or may not be true. Um, but uh, male candidates often know that, and you, you may remember some examples of this that you've seen in the press or in politics um, in your experience where a guy will kind of try to push the woman candidate off her pedestal, and once she falls from that pedestal, it's really, really difficult to get back up. Um, less so for men, and I don't need to rattle off for you, nor am I picking on men, um, all the examples of men who had a variety of different indiscretions quite publicly um, as elected officials or candidates, and 
they bounce right back, no problem. For women, that's really not the case. Once they fall off that pedestal, it is very, very, very hard to climb back up it. Um, so that can be um, a challenge for women candidates. Another challenge, uh, and we're seeing this improve over time, is that voters view women as less um, good or with less experience or less expertise on the economy. And we know that the economy is a number one in the eyes of voters. It tends to be the very top issue that, that voters are looking at, and they tend to uh, imagine that men are going to be stronger and that women are stronger on so-called women's issues, meaning health care and education and women's issues more broadly as well. Um, <clears throat> so so um, that is also a detriment in terms of uh, voting patterns and voting behaviors. That said, we have seen over time that voters are placing a bit more trust about women's economics credentials um, and that women, uh, voters used to see um, men as automatically good and women if they, they thought they had good healthcare credentials, but that didn't necessarily mean they would have good credentials on the economy. Now, that's balancing out over time, and when voters do see women being strong on healthcare, strong on education, they think, well, I think they could be strong on the economy. That wasn't always the case. So we have seen a little bit of growth in that area. Mm -hmm. How's that changed over time? How has you know, it changed from the 60s or the 70s to currently? Well, our research started in kind of the late 90s, but certainly there, as I mentioned, it used to be that if men were viewed as good on health care, they were viewed as good on the economy, and met women, as I mentioned, if they were good on health care, it had no bearing on their economic credentials whatsoever. They weren't connected in the minds of voters. That connection has started to become more established over time. The other change that's happened over the course of our research, certainly not necessarily from the 70s, but from the past two decades or so, is that women really, the, the most important thing for voters is that they were considered to be tough, that they could show that they were tough to voters. And that was very, very difficult for women to show while also being likable, which I mentioned is really a hallmark of electability. So it's difficult for anyone, but certainly for women to be both tough and likable, that's kind of a dichotomy that's almost impossible to achieve. Now what's more important to voters is actually strength. And strength is more about your convictions, about your character, as opposed to kind of taking tough political actions. So that's been a change over time that's been positive. It's a lot easier for women candidates to show that they're strong and likable than being tough and likable. And I know that's fairly nuanced, but that is something that's changed over time for the positive for women candidates, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. particularly running at the top of the ticket. Do women need to be better candidates than their male op opponents to win? Well, there is research that certainly points to that. It's called the Jackie and Jill Robinson effect um, from, I believe, the University of Chicago and I believe another university, perhaps Stanford, that partnered with a professor out there. Um, and it showed that, yes, women actually, they pass more bills than men do in the Congress. Uh, they uh, co-sponsor more bills. They work more collaboratively across the aisle. So all that is to say they kind of jump higher, do more, um, they bring more money home for their districts than the guys do as well. Um, and the effect, uh, as per this particular professor, is indeed that women have to just work harder to get to the same places as men. Um, and I'm sure there are folks in the audience who could speak to their own experiences related to that. Um, but it's exactly what you said, they, they have to do more um, in order to get to the same place. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are some of the differences when you, when you go about advising, say, a woman candidate, what are some of the strategic differences that she has got to take into account when, and her team have to take into account when building a campaign strategy? Well, the first that I think of is who's on their campaign team. Uh, what our research has found is that a gender-balanced campaign team and kitchen cabinet are critical to the success of women candidates, and particularly women running for CEO of their state, for governor. Um, 
you know, it's, it's all well and good to have a lot of women, but you really do need a good gender balance. And we've seen, um, both from a quantitative and a qualitative perspective, women candidates that don't have a gender balance team tend to be less successful. Um, it's really important, just like we talked about with wanting the best talent available and having the perspectives of different people with different life experiences in terms of your elected officials. The same goes for your campaign strategist, for your campaign manager, for your consultants and your campaign team. Um, so that's one of the things for women to consider right out of the gate. Um, the other is thinking about their fundraising plan, um, which of course, um, you know, we like money to be less important than it is in politics, but uh, it certainly is a, a real factor Absolutely. for candidates to consider. And uh, I think a common misperception is that women can't raise the same kind of money that male candidates can can raise. That's that's actually not the case. Uh, women raise the same amount of men when they're when they are candidates, but it takes them longer. It takes more phone calls, more direct interactions. They raise it in in smaller amounts, which means that they have less time to do you know shaking voters' hands or going to a rally or preparing for their debate or what have you. Um, but um, but it's important for them to think about, you know, how am I going to create a fundraising strategy that's effective and how am I going to get access to, frankly, um, the folks who I can raise that money from. Um, and, and that's where another barrier can come into play, which is we know that, you know, there are a very, very small number of women who are, for example, Fortune 500 CEOs. 4% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Um, so the pools in which women circulate, um, you know, perhaps sometimes can have um, less access to the kind of wealth it takes, unfortunately, to, to run a high-level campaign in this day and age. So that's where it takes women a little bit longer to make more phone calls. They raise their money in smaller increments. Um, so they have to create a, a campaign plan that takes that into account. Mm -hmm. How do women candidates need to approach messages in their campaign differently? Mm -hmm. um, well, they, they need to talk, this is kind of a, a fascinating finding, I think, from our research, which sounds so simple but is so important, is they need to say that they are qualified in order to be perceived as qualified. Um, so if I'm a candidate, I have to say, my name is Adrian Kimmel, I'm running for office, I'm the most qualified candidate for Congress. Um, so that is really critical in the eyes of voters. It goes a long way um, and somehow apparently seeps into the subconscious of voters that, that that person is indeed qualified. It's really an important thing for women to, to say right out of the gate. The other thing our research has found is that women really need to lead with their accomplishments. What have they achieved? What problems have they solved? What results have they gotten first? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And then then lead with their bio and kind of the other components that often are thought of as the first thing to say. But our research has really shown that actually voters want to know from a woman, what kind of results have you gotten? What problems have you solved? What are you going to do for me? Then go on to, to talk about the biographical component. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, taking that, you know, into a more practical campaign medium? What about differences in the way that you would advertise your candidacy? We've done some research on negative advertisements, and you know, certainly um, women are often told, well, you can't, don't go negative, don't go negative, you can't go negative. And the fact of the matter is, all candidates need to contrast with their opponents. There's no way of getting around it, whether you want to call it going negative or you want to call it contrasting, which sounds a lot nicer. Um, it has to be done in order for voters to understand what the difference is between two particular candidates. So we have found that there are some things that can actually help women candidates, one of which is um, actually having the woman candidate appear in the negative or contrasting ad itself. Kind of popular knowledge or kind of common wisdom was often don't have the woman candidate in an ad that's contrasting, don't have her show up in it. That, that's not necessarily a bad thing, and we have tested several ads that where a woman candidate is present, and voters actually respond quite positively to it. It's interesting that our research has shown that um, Voters remember negative ads from women candidates much more than they do male negative ads. They just sticks out in people's minds because they're not used to seeing women being negative, um, or certainly in a public realm like that. Um, but we have found that it, it is meaningful to have the woman candidate present. Another thing that goes against conventional wisdom that we found is that um, 
using humor for women actually worked. It, it kind of works best when the, the woman candidate is kind of like the straight person and then there's kind of someone funny who's involved in the ad, but that was really effective for people and for women to get their contrast across about their, component, about their opponent without diminishing their likability. Okay, okay. Um, what other double standards exist you know, that women have to deal with in political campaigns versus men. I know dress is one of them, appearance is one of them. What is, what, talk a little bit about that and other double standards. Sure, certainly, um, Bill, that's right. Appearance is a double standard that, that women see all the time. And uh, there is a study that the Barbalee Family Foundation actually funded, um, partially called Name It, Change It, which is from the Women's Campaign Forum, uh, or fund, and the Women's Media Center that addresses the issue of appearance. And when the press talks about a woman candidate's appearance, whether that be in the positive, the negative, or neutral, for example, she wore uh, a navy blue dress, that diminished the woman candidate. She went down in the eyes of the voters in terms of, you know, uh, voters' um, impression of that particular candidate, it actually didn't impact men at all. So if the press talked about a male candidate's appearance, it, had, it was neutral. It had no impact at all on the male candidate. Um, what actually helps a woman once her appearance is commented on is for her to come back in the press um, and respond to that, kind of saying that's sexist, if, in, if indeed it was something that was sexist that was said. Um, but, but it is it is a double standard, certainly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I also mentioned, you know, certainly the, the stereotypes that exist around uh, different issues. Um, women are almost universally afforded um, an advantage on women's health issues and healthcare and education at large. Um, that's not a double standard, but what I think is interesting is that it doesn't matter what the party of the woman is. Regardless of her party and her actual position on issues, she's seen as quote unquote good on women's health um, and healthcare kind of more broadly. Um, another double standard that um, we see all the time um, is again this kind of idea that women are going to be um, seen as more, more ethical and honest, um, and that men kind of using that a little bit to their advantage to knock women off that pedestal. So it's another piece that we've seen. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, the Barbara Lee Foundation has compiled is, is a list of 10 keys to elected office as a guide for women. Can you highlight a few of those keys and, uh, and just talk a little bit about how, that, uh, you know, how you came to those conclusions? Sure, yes. Well, our research, which, by the way, is available on our website, which is barbaraleefoundation.org, and we have an app as well, um, because when Barbara Lee started this research and spoke here nine years ago, we just had a little book that was uh, purse-sized, actually, purposefully, for women to carry around, and now you can put it on your uh, phone. Um, so times certainly have changed in that regard. Um, and some of the findings that um, have come out and are kind of key in our essential guide for women is, one, this dichotomy uh, and double bind between likability and qualifications that I mentioned that um, for me is the ultimate double standard and, and, and men don't face. So thinking about how can a woman be qualified, show her qualifications, um, one of the ways to do that is to uh, show that she gets results, show that she's a problem solver. Use action-oriented language, uh, talking about what she has accomplished. So not just, well, we work together to solve this problem, because women often say we. Um, that's kind of how we're trained. But to say, you know, I, I led the effort to do such and such or to solve such and such problem. So that's one of the um, pieces to our kind of roadmap called the essential guide. The other piece that's important is that voters now view women as 360 degree candidates. And that's something that for, has really changed over time with our research. Um, it used to be that voters only wanted to know, and, and really women candidates felt that they only could talk about their professional accomplishments to voters. That was it. It was kind of a very narrow uh, lens with which to have a conversation with voters. That really has shifted over time. Um, and now it's beneficial to women.
women candidates, and they understand it's beneficial, to talk about their entire person with voters, that they become more relatable and they frankly are more in touch with voters' lives uh, because they perhaps you were a waitress and uh, you know had to rely on tips and um, and you know work and ran maybe a small business or that they had kids or that they take care of their aging parents or whatever it is within their actual um, kind of whole person that voters really feel that the, the women candidates get them they get their everyday lives they get what it's like to kind of balance a budget at their kitchen table and, and something like that so that's another component to um, our research findings. Um, and then again, I can't mention enough kind of the idea that um, women are able to come back when they make mistakes on the tra campaign trail. There is kind of a pathway to that. Um, and that comes again in the form of correcting the mistake more simply, but um, more importantly, having a third party validator come in. and. And you know, I see that as a positive and a negative because it seems almost ridiculous to me that in 2015, a woman needs an accomplished, qualified woman, needs a third party validator to still come in uh, and validate whatever their position is on an issue or their credentials on a particular issue. Um, that's the negative side. The positive is it works. Um, it brings women right back up in the polls in the eyes of the voter. And that was a really important finding for us as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how does the foundation uh, get this information to candidates and how do you get involved with candidates and still be nonpartisan? Yes, um, so we have studied every woman uh, candidate for governor since 1998 on both sides of the aisle um, when they're running uh, for their general election, uh, not in a primary. Um, so every single woman has been interviewed or her campaign has been interviewed we uh, do focus groups as well as phone surveys with um, voters around every single one of these elections and candidates and campaigns and then we do a qualitative component where we interview as I mentioned the campaign managers the candidates uh, the state party chairs in that particular state the uh, members of the press or the capital press corps depending on the um, particular state and so that's a little bit about kind of the methodologies. We've been working with um, Celinda Lake of Lake Research and Bob Carpenter of Chesa Chesapeake Bay Research. So we have a bipartisan team um, of researchers as well as um, a woman named Mary Hughes out of California who've been doing research with us for nearly two decades. And then in terms of our dissemination, we share it with women um, who hold elected office on both sides of the aisle. Um, we used to mail them. Um, we've gone a little bit more in the direction of emailing them. And we, um, we distribute them to women who are mayors of towns of, or cities rather, of 10,000 people or more, um, as well as women who are serving the state legislature, statewide office holders, members of Congress, um, and beyond. Uh, and then we also tend to hold conference calls where we present the research so people can dial in um, and have access to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who are some of the rising stars on both sides of the aisle, mm -hmm. governors or otherwise, that yeah. you would point out yeah. to folks tonight? Well, certainly people are talking all the time about Governor Susana Martinez out of New Mexico. Um, she is certainly considered a rising star and is often talked about, again, as a, as a vice presidential contender. Um, there's, uh, interesting, there's a woman, um, her name is, I believe it's Elise Stefanik, I'm probably mispronouncing her last name, who's in the youngest female member of Congress to be elected. She's from upstate New York, actually, um, and she's 30 years old. So that's pretty impressive accomplishment on her part. Um, and uh, then we also have um, Senator Gillibrand is often talked about, certainly um, on the Democratic side of the aisle as a rising star. Um, Attorney General Kamala Harris, who's running in California for Senate, um, as well as kind of talked about as a rising star. There, are, there, you know, the bench is growing. We of course need more women to get out there and run um, and continue to advance up the political pipeline. But there are a lot of really impressive women out there on both sides of the aisle um, who are who are doing great things. You know, you spoke at the outset. We talked about, or you spoke about how the situation, the involvement. We don't have enough women in public office mm -hmm. today. Do you see that changing gradually, incrementally over time, or do you think that? we're kind of poised to make a, a big leap here at some point. 
Well, if you're a member of the press, you like to say every election year is the year of the woman. Um, and there was a year of the woman in 1992, and that's true. Um, but you know, we have seen a very, very slow pace of progress. And yes, there has been progress, but most certainly it has been incremental. Um, I mentioned as of tomorrow, we will have six women governors. Uh, a uh, woman is about to become governor in uh, Oregon because the governor is resigning um, and the secretary of state in that state is the person who fills that role, um, who is a woman. Um, the highest number of women governors we've ever had in our country is nine. Uh, so we did you know, make some progress and then actually slide backwards, but still nine is still not a high enough number in, in my perspective. Uh, and um, in st many state legislatures across the country, and I was talking to someone earlier in Kansas as well, um, the number actually used to be higher in terms of women's representation in the state legislature and then has slid back. So it is a little bit one step forward, two steps back. Um, we need to continue to fill that political pipeline at the lower level in order to increase the number of women. And then you know, we really do need women to use our research, hopefully, as well as others, um, to kind of find out what their roadmap is for them to be successful candidates. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Secretary Clinton, who's likely to run as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Carly Fiorina, who's likely to run as Republican for president. Uh, next year, it's hard to believe it's already next year. Mm -hmm. uh, given that, what do you think the odds of electing a woman president in 2016 are? I think we're going to come closer, uh, you know, this year than we ever have. I think, you know, voters, um, you know, seem like they're increasingly more and more open to um, voting for a woman CEO, and that's what the president is, CEO of the country. And you know, our research has shown, in terms of women being CEOs of their state, that there has been incremental progress in terms of voters' openness to um, supporting a woman candidate. Uh, you know, we know that. Independent women voters are one of the most important, increasingly important voting block for um, candidates um, at every level, including nationally. Uh, and those are the voters who are more likely to vote for a woman candidate, is independent women. Um, you know, other voting blocks less so, and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, but uh, I think it certainly is is probable. You know, also from the law of averages, there are a lot of women starting to throw their names out, um, and there 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 are more women um, than just Hillary Clinton and Carly Fiorina who have indeed expressed the most interest in the role. Mm -hmm. What do you feel that that women in today's culture? Uh, maybe face a few less challenges than, say, women of my generation older faced when they first got into public service? I, absolutely. Um, you know, certainly, you know, my generation and those younger than I am, you know, we stand on the shoulders of the previous generations and just looking at, you know, how women are kind of viewed in general and the ability for women to, you know, have careers or, or not, you know, have families and kind of balance all of that has changed over time. In fact, to the point I made earlier about a 360 degree candidate, um, one of the roadblocks to women can be that, you know, they start to run for office later in life. So it's harder to run for president if you start running for the state legislature when you're 50, um, right? The math is difficult um, to make that happen. Um, but women are running when they're younger and younger, like the woman I mentioned who's 30 and is a member of Congress. And um, that's going to kind of give women the opportunity to move up the political pipeline and move to higher levels of office. Um, there are women like Senator Gillibrand and others who do have young kids um, and are, are office holders. And I think that's been um, really refreshing for younger women to see that all of that is truly possible. Okay, I have one final question, and then we're gonna open it up to your questions um, uh, in the audience. And uh, do keep in mind that if you'd like to ask a question to uh, raise your hand and one of our students will come by with a microphone and, and you'll get a chance to ask a question. But my final question for you, Adrian, at least until maybe doing follow-ups on some of the questions from the audience is, I'm sure there are some uh, women tonight who are here with us who are contemplating either running uh, for a political office in the near future or alternatively maybe working for someone who, uh, uh, for a woman who is thinking about running for public office. What would you tell them that uh, they should do to prepare themselves and then tell them about the importance of getting involved in this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, in terms of thinking about being just involved, whether it be a staff member or a consultant or a volunteer, um, 
that it does make a difference when women's voices are heard. It impacts the policy discourse dramatically. Um, and so if you're thinking about volunteering for a woman's race, you know, give it a try. And who knows, you might get bitten with a political bug and run for office yourself. I mean, so many people who eventually became candidates were just started out as volunteers on campaigns. They just got involved and they realized, you know, wow, I could do this too. This isn't actually that hard, uh, it turns out. Um, and for women candidates, um, you know, you have to put yourself out there and it's, you know, People lose sometimes the first time. Men lose sometimes the first time. That's all fine. You need to continue. Um, the more you run, you get your name out there. The more experience you have running a campaign, um, the more successful you're going to be. I think the number one thing to remember if you're just starting out, whether you're a volunteer or you're um, a candidate or a prospective candidate, is remembering to collect all those business cards, Right? Remember to collect all those business cards. Remember to have your own business card. Um, and Barbara Lee would say this, so I'm channeling her right now. Um, and make sure you're contacting those people. You're following up with them. Maybe you're going to run for office in 10 years. Check in with people. Say, hey, remember me? We met, you know, we met at the Dole Institute that one night. That lovely lady from Boston was speaking. Um, and uh, you know, reach out to these folks, because those are going to be your volunteers later. Those are going to be your donors later. Those are going to be the people who are going to help you and be in your kitchen cabinet later on when you run for office. So every single person you're coming into contact with is important to maintain that relationship. Um, and they're going to introduce you to their friends and their colleagues. And um, that's how campaigns build. Okay, let's open it up to uh, your questions and answers. This will be a great opportunity to find out from Adrian about any research that's been done. We have a question right there. If somebody will get her a mic. There you go. Thank you, Claire. Um, could you speak a little bit about women responding to negative ads when they've been attacked? Yeah. Um, especially if maybe it's a, an ad that is, or if there are underlying sexist overtones that a woman might, might not want to be called out as saying, Oh, that's sexist? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's twofold. One is, in terms of just responding to a negative attack, um, it is OK to, to refer to that attack. In fact, we've seen that to be really effective um, through our research, is to say, you know, my, my opponent, so-and-so, said this. Well, the facts are x, y, z. I've accomplished this and then go right into the action-oriented verbs I mentioned, the results. Um, you know, it's, it's, you can kind of quickly pivot off whatever the attack is and talk about what you've achieved, what problems you've solved uh, in, in, in that person's experience, either as a candidate or in the public sector. Um, and then in terms of calling out the sexism, um, in a negative ad, we, I don't know that it would work exactly in an ad perspective um, or, or situation, um, but you can have someone else in that situation say that this was sexist or just go straight to the press and say, this was sexist. Um, and that was never done in the past. It was always considered very taboo. Someone said something sexist, well, just sweep it under the rug, carry on, don't make a fuss about it, you know, you're bigger than that, and, and that's all fine, but it actually really helps to diminish the negative effect of that sexism to directly call it out. Um, and it kind of goes against your intuition or, or it feels uncomfortable, um, but it really is effective. So either the candidate can do it depending on the venue and the forum or another surrogate can do it. Okay, other questions? Wait, somebody will get you a microphone in just a second here. Hi, I'm curious about uh, what you said about independent women being more likely to vote for women. Yeah. Um, so I would have thought that um, women or people who come from the party that has done the most to secure women's rights would be more likely to vote for women and suggest, you suggest that it, it'd be the ones in the middle. Um, well, it's not necessarily, uh, first of all, party trumps gender period, um, and that's definitely a, a, a fact. Um, but it's not necessarily Democratic women. Um, Democratic women and independent women both are more likely to support uh, to support uh, women candidates. But once you get into Democratic women, or women in general, the married and the unmarried piece also ha plays a huge role. So unmarried women are much more likely to support Democratic women candidates. Um, Overwhelmingly so. Um, independent uh, women are more likely to support women, just women, of either party. Um, uh, unmarried men and Republican men are shown to, to 
feel the least like there aren't enough women in public office. So women tend to feel like, yeah, there aren't enough women in public office. Um, it, it's Republican men and unmarried men who are like, eh, there's enough women in public office, it's okay. <laughs> okay, uh, other questions? I was, I was thinking about what Secretary Sebelius was saying the other night about her quote from Ann Richards about if, if, you're, <laughs> if you're single, you can't get a man. If you're married, you're neglecting a man, et cetera. Yeah. And, and so I was wondering if you'd done any research about how marital status affected women candidates and also kind of related to that, whether they had children or young children or older children or that kind of thing. Well, you hit the nail on the head for me. I'm dying to do that research. We haven't done it yet. <laughs> we haven't done it yet, but there, there is certainly a need for it. And, 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 and the secretary is so right, and you're so right, in that um, it's a difficult position for, for women candidates to be in because if you're you know, unmarried, then you know, you're, unre you're not relatable. You know, people, people why, why isn't she married? Um, which they would never really say of a man, I can't imagine. Um, and then certainly the kids thing, um, again, that's changing for the positive, as I mentioned when I said the 360 degree candidate and that there are women now more and more who are high profile who have young kids but when you have young kids as a candidate um, you know starting off in particular you know voters either say um, well why isn't she home with her kids um, or they say well I'm nervous I don't want her kids to be number one I'm the voter I want to be number one um, you know on her list of her priorities um, so it's a really difficult thing for for women to navigate and there's kind of a funny um, the thing that happened when Heidi Heidkamp, who's now the senator from North Dakota, was originally running for governor, um, her opponent was a man, and they both had kids kind of around, uh, you know, they both had kids, and they were, I think, in a debate, and he said, you know, well, how, how old are you, your kids? And she said, well, the same age as yours. You know, their kids were the same age. It's like no one asked them, the man that, right? So that continues to be something that, again, is improving slowly, but I think more research does need to be done in order to give women um, a little bit more of a map or, or, or kind of pathway about how to navigate that because it can be challenging. Okay, other questions? We have one here and one here. Hi, um, when you were talking about the third party validator being yeah. effective for- I'm sorry, Claire, can you hold the mic up a little further for- A third party validator being effective for improving the perception of qualification. I was wondering if it makes a difference, the gender of that third party there. Yeah. Um, in s yes and no. Um, if it's just a general mistake that a woman candidate made or something that you know, she needs a little bit more help on, um, any validator will do coming back from a mistake. However, um, when you're talking about an economic plan, which, by the way, is critical for women to have when they're particularly running for governor, and it's critical that that be public, uh, so on a website or something like that, when it's an economic plan, a male validator helps exponentially. Exponentially. Hi, I, <clears throat> sorry, I have a cold. Uh, um, another campaign advertising question. Uh, earlier this year, I attended a series with Dr. Bamwert, who's here, and our associate director, Barbara Ballard, mm -hmm. and we talked about campaign advertising for women. Mm -hmm. And one that we found particularly interesting was Joni Ernst, mm -hmm. who before um, she, was, she made it past the primaries, had a very viral campaign ad. And then when it was time for the general election, she changed her strategy pretty mm -hmm. drastically. And I was wondering if you could comment on why she thought she had to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, her, a lot of her ads, like the pig, et cetera, were talked about quite a bit. And um, if you go onto our website, um, which I'll plug in, Barbara Lee Foundation, we actually have a reel uh, uh, of ads that are um, contrasting or negative ads that have been really effective. Um, I'm less familiar with all of, of um, Joni Ernst's ads, but I think that um, you know, you're, you're appealing to a different block of voters when you're looking at a general election versus, uh, versus the primary. You know, it's a primary, that's your people, that's your base, that's who's going to come out. Um, and so you can kind of speak maybe a little bit more directly to folks and be a little bit more blunt. Um, and you're trying to then contrast 
yourself from someone in your own party. So you really need to be clear um, while not shooting yourself in the foot for your general election, and so that can be a little bit difficult. Um, you know, so, so you're kind of talking to a different audience. Once you move to the general election, you need that broader appeal. You're trying to turn out a much broader base of people. Um, you have to appear a little bit more centrist, usually, depending on the state and the political climate and the office, um, to bring everyone in kind of under your tent. So I imagine that's probably the change in her strategy and what accounted for it. OK. Seemed like there was a question like a uh, hand maybe halfway up in the back on this side. Yeah. You have another one here? Oh, we got one right over here. Um, in this, uh, what kind of classes or courses would be good for a political career to take as undergraduate and graduate studies? Um, of course, political science is, is the one that comes to mind, but I was not a political science major. Um, I think economics is also incredibly important, um, whether you're thinking about being a candidate or being even involved in politics in general. I think that's you know a, a really important um, one, and I think communications as well. I'd say all those for me would probably you know Bill, you probably might want to weigh in on this too, but um, I think those three for me would probably be the top contenders. Yeah, the only one I would add from my background is history, because yes. I think you can learn a lot about why candidates lost and why they won based on history. So, other questions? We got a question right back here. Did your research indicate uh, if there was a direct proportionality between the lack of exposure that people had to female candidates versus their double standard or negative uh, um, pre, uh, preconceptions of, the, of female candidates when you did your research? In other words, the idea being that if, if, if they were more exposed to more candidates, some of these preconceptions would fall away. Not specifically, not as pointed as your question is, but yes, we have seen, and research has shown ours and others, um, that simply seeing a woman either above the fold, if you will, um, or just generally you know, online in, in that space, the more you're exposed to women candidates um, and women elected office holders, the more likely and the more comfortable you're going to feel as a voter voting for them. So um, it, is, it is something that, that has been shown to be be true and in fact there's some other research um, done by something called the parity project um, that shows that women um, <clears throat> who have who are kind of twin states meaning there might be uh, two women senators uh, like in uh, Maine or a woman senator and a woman governor at the same time that that also increases the number of women in office in those particular states so there are a couple factors that kind of you know seeing is believing type thing and it really is true Okay, do we have any other questions tonight? Oh, we do. We got a hand over here. Yeah, thanks. Everybody keep raising your hands That's high. Hard to see. I'm looking into some, yeah, we're looking into <laughs> really bright lights up here. Um, you briefly talked a little bit about political ideology, and I'd be kind of interested to hear what you have to say about the potential for a Republican female president and what extra hurdles they would face as just basically being a Republican and a woman. Yeah. Um, so, there is research also by a group call, uh, that I mentioned, just mentioned called the Parity Project that in general, um, Republican women candidates do have a harder time of it. They have a harder time um, uh, getting through primaries and fewer of them actually run for office. Um, there is, I think one of the factors that is um, less to do just about being a Republican woman and more to do with the political infrastructure is there are few, if any, organiz Republican organizations that seek to help uh, Republican women candidates specifically. That does exist on the Democratic side. So there, there isn't in terms of, you know, if a woman runs for, for pre president on the Republican side, she's going to have to get through a pretty brutal primary. There's no organization that's dedicated or no base that's dedicated to help that woman get through that primary. Again, that exists on the Democratic side. I think that institutional um, kind of political challenge is one of the biggest ones. Okay. You want to go here, too? We don't normally allow people to ask two questions in one night, but since you're a former student worker here at the Dole <laughs> Institute, we'll make an exception. This is a little bit different from what we've been talking about, but what happens to a woman's perception when she gets married and changes her last name? 
We haven't studied that, um, but certainly I think whether it be in politics or in any profession, I mean, you, you have to you have to reintroduce yourself to voters. Um, you've got to kind of rebrand yourself. Um, and I think that is a challenge. So if you are a woman candidate, it's something that you would want to think about. Or do you use your maiden name for your campaign? Or do you use your maiden name plus your married last name? Um, but again, it's like, you know, they see your name on the ballot. And as much as all of us in kind of the political world think, well, how can you not know that? You know, because we live and breathe by it, and we're watching everything really closely. But normal people, if you will, um, there's, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna pay attention the last two weeks before the election. So all of a sudden, you know, your name was, you know, Barbara Smith, and now it's, you know, Barbara Lee. Um, people are going to be like, who is that? Uh, so it, it is something to think about for women, for sure. Okay, do we have any other questions? Oh, yeah, we still have a couple. Good. Let's get this one first, and then we'll get one over here. Hi. Um, I just had a question about, like, how women of color fit into this situation, and if you guys do any research on that. We have done, um, we kind of do that within our existing body of research. So we tend to do a lot of oversamples of um, women of color, um, and that's often broken out in between African American voter, women voters, um, and um, Latino women voters as well. Um, we, because we study women gubernatorial candidates primarily, um, our sample size for studying women of color gubernatorial candidates is fairly low. Um, we have Susana Martinez and a few others, but it is, it is fairly low. Um, but you know, that is something that we're continuing to to look at, and there are a couple organizations that are doing some really important work, including one called Higher Heights, um, focuses on African American uh, and black women in, in American politics, and the group I mentioned called the Parity Project is doing a ton of work on uh, Latino women candidates as well. Okay, then we had a question right here. Okay, so this is um, back to the question previous. So for like Hillary Clinton, do you think her last name helps her or hinder hers, considering she's tied to someone like Bill Clinton, a previous president, for if she were to possibly run for president? Good question. Um, she, you know, I think it, it, it kind of is what it is. Um, in her own right, she's been Secretary of State. In her own right, she's been a U.S. Senator. So that said, people absolutely associate her with the former president, Bill Clinton. And I think um, in some ways, yes, that can be a hindrance. Um, uh, and I think in some ways it can be a help. I mean, she's, she, one of the things our research has shown um, is that voters know that politics is an old boys club. Um, they, they know that. Um, but one of the things they want to also know for women is that they can navigate the old boys club. And having the credentials of being first lady means, yeah, you know how to play the game, right? Um, you, you can navigate the, the old boys club. And so I think that could be a real positive for her. Okay, we had a question, a couple questions right here. Oh, got one back there, excellent. Um, one of the things that Secretary Sebelius mentioned is that uh, if there's a task offered, the guy will just say, oh, I'll do it. And then the woman will say, oh, I might need to take another class. I'm not, you know, maybe just one more thing under my belt and then I, I'll be ready. Um, have you done any studies on psychology and the difference between men and women, maybe with resilience or with um, just uh, confidence or you know anything like that that could help women navigate this process? It not, we, we're kind of looking into doing that, and the resilience piece is so hugely important, and it's a, it's a true American value, so it's something that really resonates with voters. But you're exactly right, is that you know guys look into the mirror and they say, yeah, I could be president, I should run for president. And women look in the mirror and they say, well, you know, but I, I, I haven't done this, or I haven't done, taken a course in this, or I didn't take that one class in economics that I should have taken. That lady said I should have taken an economics class, and I never did it, so I shouldn't run for office. Um, so, you know, it is something that we see all the time, is that women don't, they never feel like they're good enough, they never feel like they're qualified enough. Um, and then our research, it turns out, you can actually just say you're qualified, and it goes a really long way. <laughs> um, so um, so it, is, it is a problem. I think the psychological dynamic is really important for us to think about looking at, um, because clearly, 
it exists, and there's some research uh, by a woman named Jennifer Lawless out of American University. Um, she calls it the ambition gap, um, you know, about kind of women's uh, um, interest in running for office and, and what, um, you know, what the barriers are and what encourages them. And the fact of the matter is there's a lot of reasons why women aren't throwing their hats in the ring, and some of them are practical, and some of them are due to just socialization, and it's something we need to explore more deeply in order to kind of bridge this gap. I have a question right here. I'm sorry. I'm just curious, as you know, a lot of things are run by money. If we got rid of political PACs and minimize mm -hmm. the total amount that can be spent on campaign funding, mm -hmm. would the playing ground be more equal for men and women based on their knowledge, their experience, who they are? Just curious if money is driving Yeah, I mean, I think it would definitely go a long way. I think the other side to the money piece, which I mentioned, is that, um, frankly, men still control a lot of the money in this country because they, you know, there's the wage gap. They still make a dollar. Well, we make 77 cents. Um, you know, the women are taken out sometimes of, you know, the professional world because of, you know, raising families or dealing with aging parents and all that still means that women have less access to money, generally speaking. So if you took out the super PACs and the PACs and, um, you know, reverse Citizens United and, and, and changed campaign finance law, I think it would certainly benefit women, um, but then there are kind of other larger structural issues in, in our country that we would also have to address in order to totally even the playing field financially for women candidates. Okay. Professor, did you have a question? Yes, I wanted to pose a different kind of question. It has to do with male-female partnerships in running for elective office. The most recent example, of course, being that of John McCain and Sarah Palin. Um, is there any way from a research perspective to tease out what effect, say, Sarah Palin would have had on that joint ticket as running as a woman? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in terms of gender balance on a, on a joint ticket, um, I think that that's something we're probably going to see this in 2016. I think that if there is a male nominee um, for president on the Republican side and there is a female nominee for president on the Democratic side, I would be shocked if the Republicans didn't put a woman as a VP candidate. Um, women have become, they've always been a powerful voting block, but I think everyone just kind of realized how very powerful they are as a voting block in the past few cycles, although again, they do vote disproportionately more than, than, than men do. Um, but I, I think that that's something that's going to be, um, that's probably going to be crucial, and I think the Republican Party has, re is really trying to prove themselves to women and on women's issues, um, and they're working really hard to repair some damages that were done, particularly in the 2010 cycle, um, with some kind of outlier candidates. Um, so I, I definitely see that as being a likely scenario. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Adrian, thanks so much for a great presentation Thank you. tonight. Thank you. We have two more programs in this series. They're both going to be fascinating. You don't want to miss either one of them. So uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight and hope to see you next week. That was really terrific. That was so fun. Thank you. I loved it. Good. I will never forget uh, Senator Elizabeth Dole was here with Senator Bob Dole back really? about six years ago, and we did a big program over at the Lead Center, yeah. and she talked about the guy who came up to her on her first day at law school, it was either Harvard or Yale, I can't remember which one it was, I think it was Harvard, and said, you